I want to talk to you about part of my PhD. It's basically the analysis of an air called axial flux um, permanent magma machine with um, a hub to it. Uh, my supervisors uh, Marcus Muller, John Chick, and um, Alistair McDonald. Um, basically, the outline of the presentation, I'll be looking at the background and the Ingentech technology, which is a CGN technology. Most of you are quite familiar with this. I'll explain a bit more about it. Um, the Harbuck Array, uh, 25 kilowatt, um, kilowatt prototype, um, including some modeling results, and finally a conclusion. Um, this picture, what I wanted to just show with this picture is obviously you can see over the couple of, past couple of years, wind turbines have been growing in size, and finally you can see it's almost the size of an Airbus um, airplane. But what has been mostly consistent in most of these um, technologies is the actual drivetrain. There's not been a very significant improvement in the drivetrain of these technologies. And that's one of the things that we're looking to address. Uh, this next slide, which is um, still goes back to the previous one, because of this um, having the same drivetrain, the bigger the electrical machine, you have to look at stuff like downtime, failure, and um, most of the, one of the crucial components usually fails a lot is the gearbox. And, um, you've got your rotor blades. And this this downtime to failure, this is obviously a loss of money and a few other factors. And this graph is actually produced by a guy called Tavener, and he just wanted to assess over the past couple of years one of the um, parts of the electrical machine that actually failed during uh, running and how long a downtime would take before you can actually get the machine back up and running. And this is a clear example of the um, uh, generator produced by Enercon. And um, one of the important things here is this factor. The structural support accounts for 60% of the total mass of the actual generator. And um, the mass is in the range of 220 tons, which is quite heavy. And having to deal with something of this weight becomes um, a problem during transportation and also in, during actually just managing like um, the forces that will occur in this sort of machine. So, which leads me on to the next bit, which is um, having a direct drive electrical machine. The Ingentech technology, which is um, one of the technologies that was discovered by my supervisor, Marcus Muller and Alistair McDonald, it, one of the um, key concepts is this fact of modularity. You can see here that a module consists of the stator blades and the actual two double-sided rotor blades. And what that means is essentially, if there is a failure in one section of the electrical machine, you can just take out that bit, that bit or that module, if you prefer to call it that, and the machine could run at a reduced speed or to reduce the um, electrical power. So still <coughs> improves on the downtime and um, gives you a better um, competition with other conventional machines. A few of the other um, interesting factors is this can be connected in different uh, manners. So obviously you can have it connected, each state can be connected across, or can be connected um, going around the diameter of the machine. Uh, this was a prototype that was um, a prototype demonstrated a one megawatt machine, and it consists of um, four stages, each stage about 250 kilowatts. And the beauty of this was we managed to upgrade from the 25 kilowatt machine to a one megawatt demonstrator. And this just shows the stackability of this sort of machine. So essentially, if you do want to increase the power, you just have more stacks, if I'll call it that, and therefore you can have more power. And that shows how quickly we were able to go from that to a one megawatt. And again, if you notice that individual, I think is one of the colleagues, one of my colleagues from my previous workplace, um, there was actually a failure in one of the sections of the machine. And they managed to take out that sector of the or that module and um, obviously run the machine at reduced speed and able to fix that module or replace the module fairly quickly just by using a cherry picker. So that shows how easy it is to just get into the machine and get stuff out of the machine without having to actually shut the machine down and that obviously um, reduces the performance. Um, this brings me to my next Obviously, with every new technology, there's uh, a few challenges. And um, a few of the key things I want to point out here is the fact that, I should have mentioned earlier, the fact that we are using an air-cored stator. 
typically you have um, iron in the, air, in the stator and you have slots in that machine. But in this case, I'll just go back. Yeah. Here you can see that what was done actually, this was just covered in epoxy and the stator is this air cord. And what that does is that reduces the effective flux density you have in your machine. So typically you can only get around 0 0.5 Teslas. So which, in comparison to conventional machines, um, this actually poses a problem. You've got other factors which are lower shear, shear stress, which compares your magnetic loading to your electrical loading. And then we have more permanent magnet material. What that means is you obviously, permanent magnets, they cost money and they also weigh a lot. So if you have more permanent magnets and also the forces in these machine, machines, it's quite difficult to deal with, especially if you go up in megawatts. So um, one question I want hopefully the Hubble technology could answer is how well can it improve on these factors, especially when you go up to multi-megawatts of an air cord permanent magnet machine. Um, just a brief principle, I try not to put too much formulas in here, but um, the principle behind the Hubble array is the magnetization, it rotates as you move along the array. So obviously you can see this is a typical 90 degrees Hubble array. And, um, the resulting flux density from this sort of arrangement is, um, well, I should say, um, ideally is a smooth sinusoidal waveform. Um, there's a few, there's uh, three common Hubble arrays in this um, field. Uh, you have your 90 degrees, your 6 degrees, and 45 degrees. There are a few other arrangements, and you can have various angles, angle combinations, such as 60 and 45, or 45 and 30 degrees. Um, it depends on, first of all, um, how much your budget is towards the costing and obviously the more the smaller the degree the more segment pieces you have to deal with so these are obviously dealing with several forces so the more uh, little pieces you have you have to be able to manage this properly um, just uh, some of the key features about the Habak array as I mentioned earlier you have uh, the distribution of the air gap field is more sinusoidal compared to your conventional um, electrical machine, from the magnet machine. The flux density is higher compared to the PM arrangement. So essentially you should arrive or achieve a higher flux density. And there's little or no field in the core back. What that, yeah. uh, yeah, just to explain it better. What that means is the conventional machine, a few of you may have seen in the power lab, uh, distribution of the flux density is straight through all um, three stages and that goes across the core back and obviously this is what we consider as the um, core back fields and this field obviously would generate losses in this region and these losses you obviously need to account for them considering the efficiency of the machine but with the Habak array because there is no there's little or no backside fields you can effectively replace this with um, a substance that is non-conductive and probably lighter than compared to steel. <coughs> and this just points out a few of the parts of the machine. So you have your rotor segment, the non-magnetic, which is the stator, and your permanent magnets. This is just to show the transformation from the conventional 25 kilowatt machine to the hub of 90 degrees. In this case, each stage in this case contributes to um, the power at the end of the electrical machine. So, but in this case, each stage is independent of each other. As you can obviously see, so the flux density is contained within a stage. And this is just one arrangement. Um, it's not, I'm not included in this presentation, but I'm looking at having a Habak array at the, what I call it, the top and the bottom stage, and have it still perform like it would in a standard machine, but with exclusion of the callback or the steel, what I call it that. Um, I just want to show some 3D model, uh, modeling I did in Politica, going from the current prototype to the Habak Um It's not very obvious here, but you can see obviously there's flux passing through the steel back. And in this case, I've replaced steel with a material called carbon fiber. And that, there's little or no flux in this region. So this, what that means is there's a possibility for a straight swap between steel and carbon fiber. Yeah, 
um, following on from that, I did some um, 3D final element, element analysis for the air flux density. And I was looking at your current model, your 90 degrees model, and your 60 and your 45 degrees. And you can obviously see the distribution of the flux density. Um, the only anomaly in this is the fact that what you would expect, the smaller the degree, the higher the flux density. But um, I found in this case, my 90 degrees was actually lower than my standard machine. Whereas um, the other degrees, such as the 60 and the 45, they went up in flux density, but they exhibited a sort of strange um, dip at the peak of the waveform. And um, this dip, still, I'm still trying to under, uh, understand why this occurs, but I found the bigger the, the bigger the air gap, the less you begin to see that dip. But what that means also is the less the flux density. So it's, it's trying to find a balance between that and having a, a reasonable flux density. Um, the values you see here, these are all normalized to the current machine. Um, what I looked at was the peak and the RMS flux density. Just because um, I was looking at the previous graph, you cannot exactly tell, because the most important um, factor in all of these waveforms is the fundamental, because the fundamental generates the power. And you may have a very high peak, but the actual fundamental is low compared to the other waveforms. So I decided to look at the actual RMS values. And you can see that, yeah, the 45 degrees had a higher peak, but in terms of looking at its contribution, or if there's an increase in flux density compared to the current, wave, current uh, machine, you see it's slightly lower, whereas um, the 60 is quite high. So this, this actually led me to believe, because what I was working from was going from, you actually had an existing machine and incorporating um, a Habak array into that machine, whereas typically you start from the design phase to actually consider the Habak array, and that way you can actually get the right dimensions and get the right um, spacing and how many from the magnets you are actually suitable. But um, in order to do this, you also need to have a good uh, two-dimensional formula and a three-dimensional formula. But in this case, just because of the size of the machine, the two-dimensional formula I was looking at didn't actually um, predict what I would get in terms of um, my peak flux density. So I had to move on to a, a three-dimensional formula, which I'll discuss a bit later. Um, the next other two factors that I think are interesting is the actual mass and the torque density. Because one of the arguments is having removed the steel that exists in a conventional machine and replacing that with carbon fiber, you should have a reduced mass. And just looking at this, you can clearly see um, replacing steel is about a percent less compared to the actual um, the current machine. Um, I should use this 50% loosely because I'm um, speaking to manufacturers, they still suggested having some level of steel, or some thickness of steel, only just because of the structure integrity of the actual electrical machine. So you may have a couple millimeters of steel and then you actually apply the carbon fiber to that. So it might just go up in the range of 60%, something like this. And um, you can obviously <coughs> see we've improved the torque density from the same, keeping the dimensions of the machine the same, we have a better improved torque density using a hardware curve. Um, just finally, for the conclusion, um, we've, been able, we've been able to see that the Habak array is actually, um, um, in improving the flux density, is actually able to do that. There are a few anomalies which are um, occurred, but this is probably due to the fact that we have tried to incorporate an existing machine, whereas going from the design phase, you probably have a different um, analysis. And we've been able to eliminate the need or the the need for steel in this machine, but um, again, as I mentioned before, you might still need some level of steel to keep the structure, to support the structure of the machine. The other factors I'm looking at is actually the um, induced voltage, the losses, the efficiency, and the cost analysis. And this machine, the 25 kilo machine, because it's operating at a low frequency, I didn't consider losses in this machine because it's not, it's not as significant. But at the moment, I'm working on a one megawatt design. And you, you, you call for a high frequency, so I'm actually looking at the losses as a result. Looking at just the previous waveforms you see generated by the Habakkuk, you would expect um, 
possibly a third harmonic or a fifth harmonic here. And this might actually in the, um, contribute to the actual power losses. Yeah, and finally, I spoke about um, a three-dimensional three formula by this guy called Edward Fellaini. I haven't included it here because I'm um, just at the final stages of this formula. But this formula is able to actually predict the sort of profile you get from each harbor curve. And um, what that will enable you to do is actually make changes or if you alter the dimensions and the um, distance, or uh, sorry, the thickness of the air gap, you can actually see what would the result in flux density. And this formula has been quite effective in doing that because the two-dimensional formula wasn't able to model the machine just because of the um, radial length of the machine. There was a lot that had to be considered in terms of like even leakage flux, whereas the three-dimensional formula actually predicted that to within 10%. Um, finally, which could also be done via this 3D formula and the 3D analysis, as the optimization and experimental validation. Um, I'm hoping to build um, a linear machine where I can actually um, test the sort of to obviously validate the flux density I'm getting from my formula and from my um, 3D final element analysis. Then obviously based on the best design I get here, I can actually make a model here and actually validate, um, optimize my, or actually more validate my design. And obviously, as I mentioned before, moving up to megawatt scale, because you don't see, it's quite rare to find um, a harbor array in a three megawatt scale or a six megawatt scale. Only just because obviously you're dealing with a lot of forces, you're dealing with a lot of magnet segments, which is probably one of the major problems. But I want to actually look mm -hmm. at how far you can actually push this design and then you actually know that's the limit. Because I, I predict up to probably three megawatts, um, you're going to have to contend with a lot of forces with this um, sort of technology. But I think it's, um, it's worth looking to in terms of reducing the weight and reducing cost and also incorporating that into the Ingentech technology, which gives you the opportunity to actually easy transportation and easy maintenance, then you can actually um, get a quite a good design with this. And thank you to my previous company, ETP, for the sponsorship and the University of Edinburgh. And thank you guys for listening. <laughs>